This is Coogan Cassius for IFL TV in association with MTK Global. We're in New York here for the Crawford versus Khan press conference, April the 20th. Venue yet to be decided. Delighted to be joined by Mr. Max Kellerman. How are you, sir? Doing well, you? Very well, thank you. Uh, very intriguing fight. It's safe to say that this kind of came out of the blue. We were kind of in the UK expecting Amir Khan to be taking on Kel Brook, but this fight came out of the blue. What was your immediate thoughts about this fight? that Amir Khan was the biggest name opponent or the best opponent they could get that had a big enough name to make an event with Terrence Crawford. That was my thoughts. And, and it's funny because you mentioned Kel Brook, and that was the assumption was, I think, that's an easier fight for Amir Khan whether or not he would win it. Um, neither one of those guys at the moment is considered or ever was considered the best pound-for-pound pound or one of the two best pound-for-pound pound fighters in the world. And maybe he could even make more money maybe over there against Kel Brook, that, that, hard to say, but let's assume that for a second. Why is he taking Crawford? The interesting thing about Amir Khan and Kel Brook to me is they, they, they show the old expression, uh, no good deed goes unpunished. You know, when people uh, lament Floyd Mayweather's kind of business model, which, by the way, is not always great, was oftentimes not good for fans and TV networks, but he optimized his money and minimized his risk and punishment and got out of the sport. What it points out is that what's good for the fans and the networks is sometimes diametrically opposed to what's good for the fighters. And there needs to be some kind of, like, the two have got to meet in, in the middle somewhere. And Amir Khan has been a guy, as Cal Brook has, who has always taken risks his whole career, even when he was the money man. And for his efforts... He became a little underrated, actually. People kind of dismiss his chances, and, and, and the reason people think of him that way is because he was willing to fight Canelo Alvarez, because he's willing to fight Terrence Crawford, because even though he, was, he held the purse strings at 140 pounds, he didn't duck anybody, because um, even though he's fast with a, with a stick and the, and, and the legs and everything, he doesn't f fight scared. You know, because even when he gets hurt and it's his best interest to maybe run or try to survive, he fights. And so I would say the perception of this fight, and, and Crawford's correctly the big favorite, but the perception of this fight that, well, it's a foregone conclusion and Amir is an opponent, is a result of no good deed goes unpunished. For many years, there was always talk about Amir Khan fighting Floyd Mayweather and not too long ago, Manny Pacquiao. He kind of missed out on those fights. So... Terence Crawford, easily top three, pound for pound. Currently, is this kind of, I said, within the top three? Spence, Canelo? I was kind of using just, all right, you, you don't think he's in the top three? I think he's in the top two. The question is, who's one? <laughs> Sorry, okay. I was kind of using a general pound for pound um, analogy of that. But um, is this his kind of fight with one of the best because he's missed out on those fights with Pacquiao and Mayweather in the past? Yes. K Amir Khan looked to be the kind of guy who was going to be in a position, look, the money man can determine what kind of fights he can make. And Amir Khan looked like he was going to be the money man and he could pick and choose opponents. But that's what I mean by no good deed goes unpunished. Because he didn't pick and choose opponents carefully, he wound up getting upset once or twice and then all of a sudden those fights don't happen. Because at a certain point, the risk outweighs the reward uh, for, for Amir, depending on who you're talking about, for a guy like Pacquiao or, or Floyd. Um, uh, yep, I think that legacy is important to Amir. I think he's a real fighter, in other words. And that's why he takes the Canelo fight, and that's why he takes the Crawford fight, because no punk in him. He's trying to be the best. He's trying to leave his mark. Moving away from this subject completely, what's been your kind of assessment on the whole Anthony Joshua, Deontay Wilder, Tyson Fury situation, which is very unclear what's going to happen. We know the WBC have um, ordered the fight to happen within the next 30 days or it goes to purse bids. But we've got Anthony Joshua there kind of waiting to see who he'll fight on April the 13th. People accusing fighters of ducking one another, etc., etc. What's your take on it? It's a little bright out. Hold on. Um... I would say that among the three fighters you just mentioned, Anthony Joshua, Deontay Wilder, and Tyson Fury, the boxing world is lucky that you have three guys who are not afraid to fight anyone, who have something special on the inside. 
whatever you think of Anthony Joshua's kind of like basic offensive skills or Tyson Fury's lack of punching power or Deontay Wilder's awkward style, we have seen all of those men in dire straits in the ring against top heavyweights and fight like hell and, and snatch victory from the jaws of defeat or else at least escape without a, without a loss in a situation where it looked like a loss was inevitable. Um, that, that makes them special on the inside, and that's why people are interested in them. Now, Anthony Joshua at the moment has lost with boxing fans a kind of moral high ground because he's perceived as the ducker at the moment. Anthony Joshua was not, he ain't ducking anybody. I mean, this dude, when he fought Klitschko, I, I was amazed that people thought, well, of course Anthony Joshua wins that fight. Time out, Klitschko? You mean the dude who was just flattening people for 10 straight years because he had one off night against Tyson Fury, who turns out to be better than we, than we realized, because one night he got outboxed in a kind of stinker fight? You just, that dude punching as straight as he does, as hard as he does, that's a dangerous fight for Anthony Joshua. And it was an amazing all-time great heavyweight classic brawl and a kind of changing of the guard. Um, Anthony Joshua not afraid of anybody, but if you're putting 100,000, 70,000, 100,000 people into the, into the seats every time you fight and you're making, I don't know, 30 million pounds or whatever it is for whomever you fight, why would you want to make 50 million pounds to fight a guy in a super fight when you could fight any two fighters and make more than that? In other words, the fight wasn't economically ready yet. It's getting there. And when it's there, I fully expect those fights to happen, meaning fights with, especially the fight with Joshua and Wilder. But Tyson Fury ain't going away. Like, <laughs> Tyson Fury is not trying to go away. You've got to give it to him. Um, the reason I bring up Wilder and Joshua is because Fury's not a puncher. Fury's never been perceived. Like, this is the best he's ever been perceived, right, after the Wilder fight. He's never been perceived as a future all-time great or anything like that. He doesn't look the part when he's in the ring. He kind of comes in a little overweight and everything. And Wilder and Joshua are all cut up. And, and even the Wilder's a little older, but they, they're kind of fresher names, at least. Um, but Fury ain't trying to go away. Those three dudes, we're in, a, we're in a really interesting time in the heavyweight division right now. If you were to rank them in order of one to three, how would you do it? Who's at top and who's second and third? What's so interesting about it right now is that's really unclear. It looked like a consensus had formed around Anthony Joshua because Fury was essentially out of boxing. And Joshua was a much more exciting fight and a more conclusive finish, too. I mean, you know, he beat Klitschko more thoroughly than Fury did because he knocked him out. End of fight. There's no one, not that up to anyone's opinion. Um, so there was jo And then Wilder wasn't really fighting anybody. So, but then since then, Wilder gets in the ring with King Kong and has a terrific fight with him, and then Fury and almost knocks Fury out in the last round. And um, it's not so clear that Joshua, like, I think the consensus would have been Joshua's a substantial favorite against Wilder, let's say a year and a half ago. Right now, I don't know. I think, I think that fight's made. Wilder is the kind of sexy, under, slight underdog pick for a lot of people because he's the faster, uh, probably bigger hitter, even though he's the smaller fighter, but he's faster and a bigger hitter. For anyone who has a problem with Deontay Wilder's style, like he's not really a great fighter because he's unorthodox or not by the book, very few fighters in the history of boxing give up 20, 30 pounds consistently and are nevertheless the aggressive knockout fighter. Very few. Uh, Pacquiao was a smaller fighter who was jumping on guys. Jimmy Wilde 100 years ago, literally the flyweight champ. Um, uh, Jack Dempsey, you could see it old foot. Evander Holyfield, little guy chasing guys around the ring, giving up weight, chasing great fighters around like, like Lennox Lewis and Riddick Bowe and stuff. Wilder's that kind of cat. Even though his skills may not be where they are, he's got that kind of stuff inside him. He's got that kind of punching power. So I would make Joshua a slight favorite. He is the gold medalist. Wilder's the bronze medalist. He knocked Klitschko out. Wilder doesn't have a, a, a win against a fighter like that decisively yet um king kong not quite klitschko i would say and um joshua has more orthodox skills and is bigger and stronger but damn wilder's live in that fight and then fury as i said look fury on any given night might mess around and outbox any one of these guys this is the best kind of division special fighters special on the inside i mean in the heavyweight division making great fights 
where there's no decisive, you know, we all think we want resolution. Like, we need clarity. We want one guy. No, we don't. We want the process of finding the clarity. That's called boxing, right? Like, that's what we're here for, and that's what we got. Just one final one, Max. Um, how do you see Brian and Pacquiao going on Saturday night? Pacquiao's been the more... Listen, if Pacquiao still has it left, Pacquiao should win. He has been the busier fighter throughout his career. Bronner's problem's always been that he is a natural counterpuncher who's simply not busy enough. And at one point when he was a junior lightweight, it looked like he was going to be a whole lot of... But he didn't stay at the weight. He rose in weight. He lost the advantage of his size and therefore his punching power advantage also. That was part of his size. And um, he has not compensated by working as hard as the other guy oftentimes. He relies on his counter punching and whatever punching power he does has in his, and have in his accuracy and his toughness. Bronner's a tough guy. Um, to try to offset the kind of work rate of the other guy at times. And I don't think that'll be enough against a fighter who was once elite like Pacquiao if Pacquiao still has any of the elite stuff left. Max Kellerman, thank you very much for your time. And, uh, yeah, like I said, we'll look forward to April the 20th, wherever it may land up here in New York or in Las Vegas, and we'll catch up with you soon. Appreciate it.